Once again, what a blessed time, brothers and sisters, that uh, we can share in the Word of God. Because uh, the Word of God gives us strength. From it, it is the light and uh, it is the power unto salvation, the gospel. In fact, we are told that uh, the Word of God is... Uh, a strength to those who actually believe in it. When you look at First uh, John chapter two, that uh, we are strong because the word of God dwells in us, and so it, I find joy in sharing the word of the Lord. This is where I get my strength. Nothing else can be able to give strength than the word of the Lord, and. Uh, I'm glad we are coming to the end of these sessions and uh, you have been uh, uh, blessed in the presentations that uh, we have been having, presentations on the latter rain series. They are on uh, Gospel Sounders uh, webpage and uh, if uh, you don't know, the Gospel Sounders webpage is uh, gospelsoundersministry.org you can uh, visit there and uh, get uh, material on the on every topic that uh, you may need when uh, if you want uh, powerpoints just go to the powerpoint section and you'll be able to download uh, everything that you need from that website otherwise i'm so thankful that uh, god has been good and uh, he has enabled us to go through these sessions you can forward me your questions at uh, samuelbeforce at yahoo.com. You can call me on Messenger. You can inquire anything you want from the ministry leader, Brother Zadok uh, Ponde. You can uh, inquire from uh, another ministry leader, Brother uh, Weekly for Mondi. They'll be able to help you if you can't get in touch with me. And uh, I know the, that the Lord is with them. and. Uh, whatever thing that we have presented also they can make it clear if uh, you cannot reach me so uh, you can uh, log on our website you can send the email there there's uh, a section for conduct me uh, where you can conduct a ministry leader there either brother Zadok or uh, brother Wycliffe and uh, even the people uh, concerned uh, with the uh, our ministry if you can't get in touch with us you can get in touch with uh, brother Daniel Mesa of Revelation with Daniel he will be able to help you in any way you can and so uh, as uh, the gospel sounders is uh, a ministry dedicated uh, that is the gospel sounders and Revelation with Daniel are ministries dedicated to spreading the three angels messages all over the four corners of the world this is a sole purpose nothing is to stand on our way nothing is stand by the way and uh, we shall be glad if you can conduct us so that we can schedule meetings with you uh, the COVID-19 is going away God is going to give us a little space so that uh, we may rearrange our houses but he has opened our eyes so that we may be able to see actually what is happening around the world and what can happen in a minute and the whole world will be in a lockdown and so I'm so thankful to the Lord that he can be able to condescend to this level to his creatures of mercy after they have been so rebellion for so long the Lord still with his merciful voice and his uh, 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 
every evidence that he can provide for his church. He's doing that so that our eyes may be opened. We may not be lost. When you read the book of Ezekiel chapter 33, we are told that um, surely the Lord does not have, uh, 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 does not delight in the death of the sinners, but rather they will come to repentance and have everlasting life. This is what the Lord is doing to his church. He is trying to use every means so that uh, the eyes of the people may be opened and everyone may come to repentance and they may be sealed, they may receive the latter rain and uh, uh, participate in uh, uh, actually sounding uh, the loud cry. The Lord does not predestine that anyone should be lost actually, but the predestination is that everyone may be saved. When you read the book of uh, um, Matthew chapter 25, we are told that the hellfire was made for the devil and his angels. It was not made for human beings. And if there is any human beings that will go to through hellfire, then it is his own doing, it is his own liking. The Lord is doing everything to save us. If he didn't withhold his son for us, then we can be sure the Lord is working for us and not against us. And so I'm so encouraged by the word of the Lord. And uh, I, I want to speak uh, on the subject that I love the most and uh, that uh, actually draws me near. The, the subject that made me a Seventh-day Adventist, the subject that drew me to this uh, uh, movement and drew me closer to Christ, the subject of the sanctuary, that is what we want to look to. And uh, today's presentation is a brief, out, a brief outline of the sanctuary service uh, type. This is what I want to look at and uh, I want you to take your pen, I want you to take your notebook, I want you to take your Bible. I have always told us that don't believe what the preacher is saying. Don't just say amen to everything you hear a preacher say. Go back. Before you say amen, go back to your Bible, go back to your notes. Go on your knees and ask the Lord, are these things so? Don't be in the habit of listening to preachers and saying amen. Don't listen to me and say amen. Recheck your Bible. Recheck your notes. Go on your knees. Ask the Lord, is this thing that I'm hearing the truth? Or is it a theory? Is it a conspiracy? Or is it a supposition? Is it a cherished idea? Or is it something just to instill fear and instill panic in the people's minds? No, double check what you are hearing if it is from the Lord. And if it is not from the Lord, reject it. No one has forced you to accept it. And so I welcome you to the study of today. But I want to do something. I want us to pray for a minute. And uh, I had put a special prayer on my webpage that I need us to pray about. And this is serious. Let people not take it for granted. Yes, we have to pray for our souls. We have to pray for our families. But I want us to take even one minute as we start the presentation to pray for Brother Bill Gates and Brother Fauci. Because their names, as they are being named, it's no conspiracy theory. What they are saying and what they are involved in. I, I, want, I don't want to get into personal things. But let us pray. Let us pray that these are the souls that Christ died for us. Even he died for me and I have to seek him for myself and for my family. We are told we should pray for the leaders of this world. We should pray for the leaders of government, leaders of the departments. That is what we are told in the book of uh, Timothy. I don't know if I can just uh, trace the verse quickly in the book of First Timothy. If I can't trace it, somebody can write in the comments. Uh, I don't know if it is 2 Timothy or 1 Timothy. But if somebody can find this verse, I'll be uh, will be able to uh, give the verse to me. Let me try to search it so fast so that I may see if I may get it. 1 Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2. Let us look at that as we enter into uh, a word of prayer. First Timothy chapter 2. It is not a joke just to see leaders doing everything and we are just there doing nothing. We are told let us pray for these leaders. 
First Timothy chapter 2 verses 1 and 2. I'll highlight it, put it on the board and uh, then we can pray. Just we can take one minute in prayer. This is what uh, the Bible says. First Timothy chapter 2 verses 2. First Timothy chapter 2 verses 1 and 2. I exhort you, I exhort therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving thanks be made for all men, for kings and for, the, or for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in godliness and honesty. So I'll take up this verse and uh, I want us to just take a minute and uh, give thanks to the Lord and pray for these leaders. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, Thou art the one that uh, raises up the people to the position of high authority. And You are the one that brings them low. Our joy is not that anyone may be lost. Our joy should be that everyone should be in heaven. For hellfire was made for the devil and his angels and not for humanity. I'm offering this prayer, not Lord, because I'm so good and my tongue is so clean and my language is so smooth to be attended to by the heavenly angels. I'm praying this because I'm a perverse man with perverse lips, living amidst a people who are unclean also. Like Isaiah, I need you to touch my lips so that I may speak to thy children. But before that happens, Lord, I only need this prayer. May you touch Brother Bill Gates and Dr. Fauci. All their plans, Lord, thou knoweth. If men have spoken things which are not so against these brothers, if they are not behind what is going on in this world, May you, Lord, forgive us and start with me because I have ever posted their videos. But if, Lord, this is true that these men are behaving like this, I do pray, let the angels that have been commissioned, even the guardian angels for these men, Father, not give them rest until they give their hearts to thy Son, Jesus Christ. And thank you so much because there is no prayer that you will never answer, Lord. If it is made with the sincereness of the heart, you say that you listen to the contrite heart and pertinent hearts. Father, I'm not the one who is worthy to pray, but thou knoweth my intentions. Touch these brethren and touch our hearts once again. And as we look at the plan of redemption, the outline of the sanctuary, the blood of thy son Jesus Christ, may it speak to us that at the end of this discourse, your children may draw closer to thee. Thank you, Lord, for hearing us and thank you for answering us. It is in Christ Jesus' name we have prayed by faith. Amen. And so, brothers and sisters, we are living in serious times. It is no time to joke anymore. It is a time that uh, we re-examine our lives personally and see really have we walked in the light that we have received as a people? Have we tried everything that we can do to save our families? Have we tried to induce those whom we call friends to come to the saving truth? This is the question that is lying at the table of everyone. This is something that need to be asked by every Bible-believing Christian who actually have the hope of going to heaven. That have I used the grace and opportunities? We are told that the opportunities we have been given to reach unto the others and did not use it, it is accounted to us as sin. And so we have to ask ourselves, have we used these opportunities to the glory of God or have we squandered the opportunities? I know I have not used every opportunity. I'm trying to use every opportunity that I have been given. God forbid that I may be found slumbering and sleeping, not doing my best to prepare my family, 
to prepare our people and to reach out to my friends and tell them what is happening to this world and what is about to transpire in the heavenly sanctuary. Probation is strictly closing on us, yet men do not care what happens in their lives. This is something that needs to awaken everyone. We have been preaching about this thing since 2012, talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ, talking about the pandemics, talk, talking about the disasters. I remember I made this call when we had the meeting, last come meeting. Let be people be prepared because we do not know what is coming to the world. That was the first presentation. And our brethren followed there and gave discourses for the people to prepare. Presentation after presentation. The work that was going on in the country living, our brothers from the coastal region showed us the evangelistic work that was going on there. And the other things that were going on around the world, we were shown what is transpiring. And I just want us to go through the heavenly sanctuary as an outline of the plan of redemption. I feel that uh, we must do something at such a time as this. The Lord is calling us. And so uh, the presentation of the time is uh, uh, a brief outline of the sanctuary service, the types and the antitypes. This is what we want to look at because the Lord will want us to learn. The Lord will want us to understand what are the three angels' messages and how they have to be proclaimed in the world. How the blood of Jesus Christ is efficacious for our life. It was the purpose of God since creation that uh, every creature from the holy seraph to the human beings may be the dwelling temple of God. This was the purpose of God. Every seraph, every uh, human being, created being, should be the dwelling temple of God. But uh, this was mad with the uh, with sin. Sin came and destroyed everything that God had put in place. I, I like to show you something. I thought I think I, I'll get it. Let us see. This is found in uh, Desire of Ages, page, six, page 161. This is so beautiful. I, I want to speak about the sanctuary and I believe this is important for us. Let us look at Desire of Ages 161 and see what it says. Please, if you have a question, drop it there. Thank you, Sister Adeline, for joining in. Thank you, Sister Caroline. And thank you, for Brother uh, Jahilon. If you have a question, drop it there. I'll be able to attend to it. If the network is not okay, also let me know. If the volume is not okay, let me know. I want us to get this clearly today because the Lord wants to speak to us. It says, In the cleansing of the temple, Jesus was announcing his mission as the Messiah and entering upon his work. That temple erected for the abode of the divine presence was designed to be an object lesson for Israel and for the world. From eternal ages, it was God's purpose that every created being, from the bright and holy seraph to man, should be a temple for the indwelling of the Creator. Because of sin, humanity ceased to be a temple for God. Darkened and defiled by evil, the heart of man no longer revealed the glory of the Divine One. But by the incarnation of the Son of God, the purpose of heaven is fulfilled. God dwells in humanity 
and through saving grace the heart of man becomes again his temple. God designed that the temple at Jerusalem should be a continual witness to the high destiny upon open high destiny open to every soul. But the Jewish had not understood the significance of the building they regarded with so much pride. They did not yield themselves as holy temples of the divine spirit. So it is by his divine spirit that the Lord dwells in this human temple. The courts of the temples at Jerusalem, filled with the tumult of holy traffic, represented all true, truly the temple of the heart. Defied by the presence of sensual passion and unholy thoughts, in cleansing the temple from the world's buyers and sellers, Jesus announced his mission to cleanse the heart from the defilement of sin. From the earthly desires, the selfish lust, the evil habits, the corrupt the soul, that corrupt soul. The Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom he delight in. Behold, he shall come, said the Lord of hosts, but who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For his is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and pipe them as gold and silver. Malachi 3 verses 1 to 3. And so from the onset, we see that the very purpose of God was that every living human being and every holy seraph may be an abode of his divine divine presence, the Shekinah glory, the Holy Spirit. But that plan has been thwarted by the devil. But through incarnation, that plan is again fulfilled or revived so that in 1 Corinthians 3.16 we are now told that uh, know ye not that your body is the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. And then Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, I beseech you then, brethren, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice acceptable unto the Lord, being not conformed to the pattern of this world, but by the renewing of the Spirit, which is an acceptable service unto the Lord. And so when we look at the outline of the sanctuary, the type and the antitype, we find that in that brief illustration in the wilderness, the Shekinah glory filling the holy temple after the sacrifice were accepted, that is the same thing in the antitype that when we offer ourselves unacceptable to the Lord, the divine presence, the Shekinah glory, the Holy Spirit of God now have an abode in our life and then we can say that Christ in us the hope of glory. The earthly sanctuary was not only an object lesson of the heavenly sanctuary, it was a pattern of the soul temple. It revealed the high destiny upon to every member of the human family that is found in Leviticus chapter 26 verses 11, chapter 12 also, chapter 26 verses 11 and verse 12, and 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 16, and when you read Exodus 25 verse 8, we are told and the Lord took the Moses into the mountain and told, showed him the pattern of the heavenly sanctuary and told, them, told him, Let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, according to the pattern that I have shown you on the mount. So, if, let us say that uh, if... Uh, the temple or the sanctuary in the wilderness was a type of the soul temple, then every pattern, everything that the human soul temple has to do has to be according to the pattern of the Lord. And why did the Lord say that they may make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them? Why did he give this? Because when you go to the book of Exodus, the book of Exodus, chapter 25 let us go there exodus 25 exodus 25 and i'm looking at verse uh, verse 22 exodus 25 verses 22 it says 
And there I'll meet with thee, and I'll commune with thee from the above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony, all things which I'll give thee in commandment unto the children of God. So the sole purpose of the temple being made, and the sole purpose of the divine presence living in us, is that the Lord may be able to commune with us. This is like a broken relationship which... God himself wants to restore. We are the children of uh, we, we, we are children of wrath. But uh, the Lord will want to do something. The Lord will want to reconcile us unto himself so that uh, we may be again be an abode of his Shekinah glory. When you read Isaiah chapter 59, Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. Let us be there. Isaiah, the book of Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. This is what we read from the word of the Lord. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear but your iniquities have separated between you and your god and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear for your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity your lips have spoken lies your tongue has muted perverseness and so with the same with the same uh, tongue that the people went into the sanctuary to confess their sins while they actually slew the lamb which was a type of the lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world, they only defiled themselves with that blood, for after living there, their fingers were full of iniquity, for their uh, uh, lips have spoken lies, and their tongues had muted perverseness. Meaning that all their approaches unto God was nothingness but a mere profession that actually they had confessed their sins, but there was nothing to show for what they were doing. The sanctuary itself, when we look at it, it had two apartments, the holy and the most holy place. The priests were always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God, but into the second when the high priest alone once every year. These two divisions in the sanctuary service were called the daily and the yearly service. Now, I want you to take notice of something that is so important. This is in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 to 7, Exodus 29, Leviticus 16, and Patriarchs and Prophets, page 357. The daily services constituted of the priestly services but we held the yearly services which were done by the high priest. The daily services were the sinners coming, sinning and forgiveness, sinning and seeking forgiveness. But when it reached the yearly, it was not sinning again and asking forgiveness, but it was a time of blotting out the sins that had gone beforehand on the veil of the sanctuary. So even though there was a forgiveness on the day of atonement, what per se was transpiring was the blotting out of sins that had gone to the veil of the sanctuary. And so the people, the comers there in, into the sanctuary, they had to be sanctified their conscience, according to Hebrews chapter 9 verses 14. They had to be made whole so that something must happen in their lives. And this is what uh, I, I like to read for you. In the daily services, this is what we had. Let us go to the book of Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. I think it is verses 10 or something like that. Hebrews chapter 9 from verses 6 to verses 14. This is what I want to read. We are going to study brethren today. And not only are we studying. Let us seek the Lord in prayer because probation is closing stillly on us. Hebrews chapter 9 from verse 6. Have your Bible, write notes, refer to your, don't just look at the screen, don't listen to me. Take the notes. Hebrews chapter 9 verses 6. Let us read. 
concerning the daily services and the yearly services. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But in the second went the high priest alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices, that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to conscience. So in the daily services, brothers and sisters, in the bringing of the sacrifices every morning and in the evening, the comers therein, according to Hebrews 9, 9, that could not, the, these things could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. And so this is what composed of the daily service, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. So the daily service was actually imposed on these people until the time of reformation. And what is this time of reformation? But Christ being come on a high priest, now the work of the high priest we know it was in the most holy place. So the daily services could not make the comers in there perfect as pertaining to the conscience, but God accepted the face of righteousness of those who came therein because of the truth that had been revealed unto them. But now in the time of reformation, Christ being our high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect target, tabernacle, not made but with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Verse 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, Hagi Hagiai, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies the, to the purifying of the flesh, not the conscience, and God accepted that face of righteousness, of just purifying the flesh, because the sacrifices of the daily services could not make the comers therein perfect. That is so clear that these daily sacrifices could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, but it make him, it sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. That is the face of righteousness that God accepted on the day, on the daily services. But now he is a high priest and we are in the daytime of reformation. And so what is expected of us? How much more, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And so in the time of reformation, we are told this, that how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to us now purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living god and so in the daily services only the comers therein will be sanctified of the flesh and not pertaining to the conscience but the blood of jesus christ who is our high priest now purges our conscience in that, what does it mean to purge our conscience? It means to restore the frontal lobe that was destroyed by Satan so that it may have the seal of God and we may be able to walk not according to the pattern of this world but we may be purged from dead works and serve the living God. Now look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, just some verses down towards there. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers there unto perfect. 
for then would they not have ceased to be offered? Why did the offerings continue? Because the karmas there unto were not made perfect. So the sacrifices had to continue. Because that the worshippers once part should have no more conscience of sin. So if the sacrifices continue, it means that the conscience of sins have not been purged. But if the conscience have been purged, then there is no more sacrificing for the sins. You, you say that is heresy, but go down to 10, 17 and 18. Verses 10 to verses, uh, chapter 10, verses 16 to 20. It says, this is the covenant I'll make with them. At what time? At the time of reformation, at the time of the high priest, at the time that Christ has shed his blood. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And this is the purging of the conscience, the writing of the laws into their hearts and in their minds. This is the purging of the conscience. Why? And their iniquities, sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Why? So, now where remission of this, what? Remission of sins and iniquities is there is no more offering of for sin so this is what hebrews 10 is talking about that the sacrifices continued daily and yearly because the comers there unto were not made perfect but christ entering into the most holy place with his own blood his work is to purge our conscience of sins so that there will be no more offering for sin why? Because where there is no sin, there is no more sacrifices. So by a new and living way which hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, he is a high priest and has purged all our iniquities. Praise the Lord. This is the message of the most holy place. This is the message to the Seventh Day Adventists. This is a message for me. This is the message for our families wherever you are listening. This is what Christ wants to do for this generation. And these daily services continue. But uh, these daily services were to be done away so that we may have a yearly service. In fact, when you read in Daniel chapter 8 verse 14, it says, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, then shall the conscience be purged, then shall the, those, the karmas therein may be made perfect. Then shall the worshippers there have the seal of God. Brothers and sisters, we are talking about matters that pertain to the outline of the sanctuary service. This is number 20 in the series, The Latter Rain. This is the second last presentation. This is the Latter Rain series. And there is no way we are going to participate in this if on this day of atonement, then we shall continue in sin. When you look in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, quickly, the book of Daniel, chapter 7, the book of Daniel, chapter 7, uh, I'll try to see a verse there. Verses 25 to 28. Let us read to, together. The word of God says, And he shall speak great words, that means the little horn, against the Most High, and shall wear out the sins of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. That is 1260 years which ended in 1798. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion. So, I want you to notice very carefully what the prophet Daniel is speaking to the church. This is more important. Thank you, Brother Johan, Frederick Hansen. It is good to see you logged in. And thank you, Cecil, for joining in. May the Lord bless you as we go through this presentation. Feel free to ask a question, feel free to comment, and feel free to say anything, to correct anything. If anything goes amiss, we are studying the word of the Lord. This is the outline of the sanctuary. This is the number 20 of 21 in the series, The Latter Rain. And we are talking about the work that has to be done on the day of atonement. May the Lord bless us. Let us go through Daniel chapter 7 verses 25 to 
25 to 28. We, we read, After the little horn being given a time and times and the dividing of time which ends in 1798, we are told, After that time, 1798, the judgment shall sit. And that judgment that we are talking about, we find that it is in 1844 when judgment shall sit. And what shall the Lord do? The Lord shall take away his dominion. The dominion of what? Of the little horn. To consume and destroy it unto the end. So the work of the Lord, we know that the devil, that serpent, Satan, is using the little horn to find a way in the lives of God's people. And so what the Lord does on the day of atonement is to take away the dominion of the little horn, which is the works of Satan, which is sin per se. Some people think that the taking away of the dominion of the little horn is destroying the little horn. No, there is the taking away dominion and then to consume and then to destroy in a chronological way like that. So the taking away of the dominion is taking away the sins of the karmas in the sanctuary so that they may not be under the spell of the little horn, which is to sin. And then what the Lord will do is to consume the sins in the people and to consume the little horn so that he may not have power over God's people and then at the end destroy the little horn and the works of evil. That is the work on the day of atonement when the judgment shall sit and it started in 1844. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven, this is the kingdom of righteousness, shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. He thought to the end of the matter, as for me, Daniel, my cogitations much troubled me, and my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. And so there are things that uh, Daniel, when he had, he could not comprehend what was being said. He could not comprehend how these things would happen. He, he went into a deep thinking that is cogitation of what the Lord was speaking. He was contemplating. Look at that word again. What Daniel said. He says, he thought to the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my cogitations, my thought, my meditations, my thinkings much troubled me. And my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. There were things which had to trouble the man of God. But nonetheless, they have to happen and the sanctuary cleansed. This is the secret of the cleansing of the sanctuary. And so after the karmas therein had been cleansed, they were able and they were ready to share in the blessings of the Lord. Everything that was all the apartments. You look at the candlestick that had light. You look at uh, the table of shoe bread that had the bread of light. And you go into the most holy place where we had the mercy seat. We had the angels, covering angels. And we had the book of law. We had the hidden manna. We had the Aaron's roll that budded. After the commas therein were made perfect, then they could enjoy the privileges of these things and be able to be instrument to be used in the uh, by God. And this is what Christ now says. If the commas therein be made new, what happens? Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter five, reading from verse 17. Let us see this to verses 21. We are looking at the brief outline of the sanctuary and what it means to be in the day of atonement. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 from verse 17. The word of the Lord reads, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 
and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now, when, now then we are ambassadors of Christ, representatives of the heavenly sanctuary, representative of the new Jerusalem. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What a condemnation that God will not put aside his perfect law but will give his son to die for us so that we may come back to him. And as it was his purpose that every man may be a dwelling place of his Shekinah glory, the divine presence, we may be restored unto him and we may dwell in his presence without being consumed. The great purpose of the yearly service was to cleanse the worshiper from the record of sin. Let me just go through this. The great purpose of the yearly service was to claim the worshiper from the record of sin. Many Jews did not understand this, for they thought the high priest was only cleansing the tent from the record of sin. What a sad state of affairs, that only what the high priest could think was the cleansing of that veil that was in the temple during the day of atonement, and they could not comprehend what was going on. We think that Christ is in the heavenly sanctuary, looking at the records of the book while actually his main purpose is to make us whole again so that he may find an abode of the presence of the Father and himself in our life via his spirit. They did not realize that they were the sanctuary and that because of all sins which we had committed, they were in the need of cleansing in the inner sanctuary of the soul. All that day shall, be, shall the priest make atonement for you, to cleanse you that you may be cleansed from all your sins before God, the Lord. Yet the people thought that at that day it was only the tent and the veil that was being cleansed. What a, star, a sad affair of the things. Welcome Sister Patricia Hand. We are looking at the brief outline of the sanctuary services. What are we supposed to be doing on this day of atonement? What is our call as a people of God? Of course, some did not recognize the precious lesson which illustrated how God was to cleanse the inner sanctuary of the soul. What they saw was only a tent. What they saw even after the wilderness experience was the Solomon's temple and not the Shekinah glory of the Lord dwelling in man. 2 Corinthians 6, 16. 2 Corinthians 6, 16 to 17. 2 Corinthians 6, 16 to 18. This is what the word of the Lord says. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I'll dwell in them and walk in them, and I'll be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you. I'll be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. How did Christ become and remain the Son of God because of His purity and holiness. And we are told in John chapter 1, for them that accepted Him, He gave them the power to become sons of God. Sons and daughters not are born of the will of man, but the will of God. The special purpose of the day of atonement was not to cleanse the soul from the guilt of sin. All this was available in the daily service. 
In the yearly ministry, a cleansing was provided for the record of sin in the soul temple of the worship. Sin marks the soul as well as defies the soul. Let me say this. In the daily services, you had, you had this habit of sinning and coming. And it, was, it worked only for the sanctifying of the flesh. But on the day of atonement, now the records of sin, perpetual sinning, is not going on the veil of the sanctuary. But what has gone there, what you have been found to be, is taken away so that you may be given a new heart and a new spirit not to continue in perpetual sinning, not to continue sinning and repenting. In fact, uh, uh, this is what uh, uh, the prophet tells us about this issue on the day of atonement and uh, how actually the Lord is not pleased with us. This is what she says in the book, uh, in the book, uh, Testimonies to the Church, Volume 4. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 4. Pages 534, Paragraph 4. 4534.4. Inspiration speaks to us. Communion with God imparts to the soul an intimate knowledge of His will. But many who profess the faith know not what true conversion is. They have no experience in communion with the Father through Jesus Christ and have never felt the power of divine grace to sanctify the heart. Praying and sinning, sinning and praying, their lives are full of malice, deceit, envy, jealousy and self-love. She says, the prayers of this class are an abomination to God. True prayer engages energies of the soul and affects the life. He who thus pours out his wants before God feels the emptiness of everything else under heaven. All my desire is before thee, said David, and my groaning is not hid from thee. My soul thirsts for, the God, for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me. Sinning and praying, praying and sinning, this becomes an abomination to the Lord. It is something that is unacceptable on the day of atonement. And so for how long shall we continue in such a service? The purpose of the yearly services. The day of atonement was a complete cleansing of the people of God. The main purpose of the end time events, by the way, let me re reiterate this. The main purpose of the end time events and Christ in the most holy place it is not what is happening in Middle East. It is not even what is happening in the USA. Neither is it anything that is happening in your country. The main purpose as we speak right now is to know what Christ is doing, how it affects your life, and what shall be your final standing when Christ leaves that, leaves that place to intercede no more. Shall you be found wandering in the balances of the sanctuary? Shall you be found that you have not prepared yourself, that you are busy looking at this and looking at that, trying to find out every minute thing that is going on in the world while your soul temple was neglected, which is the most important thing. The cleansing of the sanctuary is going on and this should engage soul and mind in every way. While the high priest is still in the most holy place, the people are required to gather around the sanctuary and search their hearts and reach the spiritual attainment, the full stature and measure of the man Jesus Christ. You ask how will this actually be done? With deep unworthiness of feeling for yourself, knowing that there is nothing good that springs from you, but it depends on the blood of Jesus Christ. And you cannot, as you cannot just change the leopard's spots, so you cannot change your soul, but all you have to do is tell Christ, take my heart and seal it. I cannot even give it to you myself. 
For human heart are so deceptive. One day somebody will say, I've given myself to Christ. The other minute they are doing things that we never imagine. Our work is to tell Christ I'm unworthy. You yourself, if you take my heart and you take my holy body, I can be consecrated unto you and reproduce a character that is fit for heaven. Not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord. This attitude is the one that should engross every karma there in the sanctuary. The Israelites understood, some did not understood. But the modern Israelites have no excuse of pleading ignorance to what is going on in the heavenly sanctuary above. Because everything has been revealed to them. I may say everything. And I don't want to sound like a laudition we are increased in goods and in need of nothing rich. No, we are poor. We, our eyes are blind. That is what we are taught. And what we need is the presence of Christ in our lives. So that we may understand his directive and not only understand but run unto him who have the strength to enable us to walk like his son walked. Thus the sanctuary reveals the Lord's plan for all the people living in such a time as this. He doesn't. And when you go back to Hebrews chapter 9, the verses we read from verses 11 going downward to verse 14, where actually the sacrifices that were made, the blood of the goats and the bulls, could not make anyone perfect but unto the sanctifying of the flesh. But Christ as coming in the time of reformation. Now his work is through the eternal spirit to purge the conscience, meaning that to rectify the frontal lobe so that he may, may comprehend the sinfulness of sin and be able to be given to Christ. Talking about this, the cleansing of the temple. We, we have to understand that in that time, the face of righteousness they offered was acceptable to Christ. And that is what we call the permissive will of God. At that time, flesh was accepted. At that time, many things were accepted at that time. But in the day of atonement, it is a restitution. It is a reformation. It is a redoing the perfect will of God and not the permissive will of God. Because in the shadows, it was only some permissive will and the face of righteousness of there who came into the sanctuary to be sanctified the flesh and not be made perfect by conscience. That was accepted. But in this time of atonement where we have a great light, God cannot accept permissive will, but he accepts the perfect will. Because he says his strength is sufficient at such a time. He doesn't accept actually partial or permissive will. And that is why he says in Acts chapter 3 verses 19 to 21. That until the time of restitution we must repent that our sins may be blotted out. No more sin going there. If the sins are being blotted out of the veil of the sanctuary, it means that nothing else is going there to defile the sanctuary. And so it means a people being clean and then being made whole again until the time of restitution. What is the time of restitution? The time of be giving us back the garden of Eden that was lost. Eden lost, Eden restored. And as we look at the bread and the incense that went up in the heavenly sanctuary, in the, in, in the earthly sanctuary, and then we look in the day of atonement, we find that Christ is doing everything. He says that uh, uh, in John 6, 63, the words that I speak unto you, they are life, they are spirit and life. That is the bread, the real bread. And the incense is his blood now. It is not that thing being waved in the sanctuary. It is the prayers of the saints mingled with the blood of Jesus Christ, not the blood of heifers or the gods or the bulls. I, I pray that these things may resonate with us. There is a sanctuary in heaven and there is a work going on. And the karmas they are in, must know that uh, the Lord is measuring them. And as we partake of the daily bread, he says that my bread is a real food and my blood is a real drink. Whoever eateth of this shall never hunger and whoever drinketh of this shall never feel thirsty. 
Do we take the word of God as it is? As Jesus has passed into the most holy place, do we take it as seriously as it is? And know that he is able to wash us and cleanse us. Jude 24 and 25 says that he can be able to present us before his father faultless without sin. And so we are exhorted this. Let me read an encouragement to us. Maybe we read an encouragement, it will encourage you. We like to be encouraged. Hebrews chapter 12. Brothers and sisters, we are in the day of atonement. And whatever we do, we must be serious with it. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 4. This is number 20 in the series, The Latter Rain. The presentation is a brief outline of the sanctuary service. Hebrews chapter 12. Let us look at it. Wherefore, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witness. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So a race has been set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such a contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Verse 4, ye have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin. Brothers and sisters, have we reached at a point in this day of atonement we have resisted sin unto blood? Maybe if you want to know the experience of resisting sin unto blood, let us look at the Bible once again. Luke chapter 22. Let us start from verse 39. Verse 43. Brothers and sisters, I don't know how I can speak better. 39. And he came out and went as he were warned to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. We are talking about resisting sin unto blood. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that you enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him, and this is what the angels are doing. They are actually looking for people who are agonizing. I will show you this in a minute. And those who are only agonizing, they are the ones that the angels will attend to. Christ was agonizing in the garden, and in the Mount of Olives. He was agonizing and telling the Father, if it is possible, but not my will. And then the angel came and strengthened him. But what happened? And being in an agony, seeing that sin was about to bring him down and he was about to give up, and being in agony, he prayed more easily because we are told the humanity of Christ could not have led him to Calvary. It was only by the strengthening of the divinity when the angels came down to minister unto him that he was able to go through the agony of Mount Olivet and Gethsemane. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was as it were drops of blood falling down to the ground. Have we resisted sin in the day of atonement to the shedding of blood? And when he rose up from prayer and was come to the disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude came. So in such a time as this, when the heavenly 
when the judgment is going on in the heavenly sanctuary, the state that people can only be found in is a state of asleep. Now, I'll want to show you what the angels are doing, then I'll come to verse 45 of Luke chapter 22, verse 45, where actually people are sleeping, and what does it mean with these disciples sleeping? Let us go to the book of uh, early writing. Early writing. Uh, For Jesus Christ was agonizing. And what did the angels do? Yes, this is it during the shaking. It says, I'll just highlight it so that uh, you may be able to see it well. Heavenly Father, bless your word as we go through it. In Jesus' name, Amen. I saw some with strong faith and agonizing Christ, pleading with God, their countenance were pale and marked with deep anxiety expressive of their internal struggle. Jesus being in the Garden of Gethsemane, Luke chapter uh, uh, 25, verse, uh, 22, verses 44. I believe that is the verse. Luke chapter 22 verse 44 and being in agony he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground early writing this is what we are told in the book early writing pages 269 their countenance were pale and marked with deep anxiety expressive of their internal struggle firmness and great earnestness was expressed in their countenance large drops of perspiration fell from their forehead just as christ dropped perspiration of blood this agonizing one were in the same state is that your condition is that your state is that my state brothers and sisters now and then their faces will light up with the marks of god's approbation and again the same solemn honest anxious look will settle upon them evil angels crowded around pressing darkness upon them to shut out jesus from their view that their eyes might be drawn to the darkness that surrounded them, and thus they be led to distrust God and mama against him. Their only safety was in keeping their eyes directed upward. Angels of God had charge over his people, just as an angel was over Jesus Christ in the garden. And the poisonous atmosphere of the evil angels was pressed around these anxious ones. The heavenly angels were continually waiting, wafting their wings over them to scatter the thick darkness. As the praying ones continued their earnest cries, at times a ray of light from Jesus came to them to encourage their hearts and light up their countenances. Some I saw. Now this is where it is. Look at this place. There are those who are agonizing in their condition and perspiration is dropping down as it were blood like Jesus in the Mount of Olives. But others are in a state where actually it says some I saw did not participate in this work of agonizing and pleading. Is that your case? Is this my case? They seemed indifferent and careless. They were not resisting the darkness around them, and it shut them in like a thick cloud. The angels of God left this and went to the aid of the earnest praying ones. I saw angels of God hasten to the assistance of all who were struggling with all their power to resist the evil angels and trying to help themselves by calling upon God with perseverance. But his angels left those who had no effort to help themselves, and I lost sight of them. And then we have the verse 44, I, 45. I was looking at verse 44 where Christ was in the garden and his sweat was like the drops of blood. And also the agonizing one, they had the perspiration as drops falling down. But now look at verse 45. And when he arose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. This was the state of the disciples. What were they doing? they were sleeping in this sleeping what is it represented in this sleeping go to 2t 227 2t 227 2t 227 this is what we find in 2t 227 is it 3t or 2t sorry Oh, brothers and sisters. Yeah. 
in this representation of the sleeping disciples. is represented let me see I just lost it but I'll find it for you right now two T two or five I'm sorry it says I hope you can see it on the screen it says we are talking about about verse 45 let, let us read again. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to the disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. This is at that time. And what did it represent at our time when we are in the day of atonement? 2205. The Son of God went away the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And again he came to his disciples and found them sleeping. Their eyes were heavy. By these sleeping disciples is represented a sleeping church when the day of God's visitation is nigh. It is a time of clouds and thickness, darkness, when to be found asleep is most perilous. Do you see that? In these sleeping disciples is represented the sleeping church when the visitation of God is nigh. Is that what? We want to be found doing? No, we will not want to be found doing such a thing. Brothers and sisters, this is not how it should be. 2T 337.2 We are told ministers should become Bible students. At the truth which they handle mighty, then they should seek to handle them skillfully. Their ideas should be clear and strong and their spirits fervent. Or they will be, or they will weaken the force of the truth which they handle. By tamely presenting the truth, merely repeating the theory without being stirred by it themselves, they can never convert men. If they should live as long as did Noah, their efforts will be without effect. Now, remember how Noah worked, and he was only able to save his own soul. Their love for souls must be intense and their zeal fervent. A listless, unfeeling manner of presenting the truth will never arouse men and women from their death-like slumber. They must show by their manners, by their acts and words, and by their preaching and praying, that they believe that Christ is at the door. Men and women are in the last hours of probation, and yet they are careless and stupid. And ministers have no power to arouse them. They are asleep themselves, sleeping preachers, preaching to a sleeping people. People do not realize that we are in the day of atonement. People will like to do anything. And what shall be said? What shall be done? Actually, we need to put on Christ. We need to know our standing with our God. The prophet says that... Uh, we are we are in the great day of atonement this is found in uh, 1SM 124.3 I, I like us to read together this uh, we are in the great day of atonement when our sins are by confession and repentance to go beforehand to judgment. God does not now accept a tame, spiritless testimony from his ministers. Such a testimony will not be present truth. The message for this time must be made in due season to feed the church of God. But Satan has been seeking gradually to rob this message of its power that the people may not be prepared to stand in the day of the Lord. 1 SM 124.3 This has been the master plan of the arch enemy of truth that the people may not stand. It is a time we came to Jesus. Freely he justifies us. Are we going to misuse his grace? Is our condition the condition of the Pharisees and the men in the book of Luke chapter 18? Where we found actually they say, I thank thee, O God, that I am not like other men. I am not an extortioner. 
I'm not an adjust adulterer or even as a this publican, and I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all I possess. Is this the situation that we have to be found in? No. If we will be saved on this day, we have to feel of our nothingness. The, the litmus pen should not be what other men are. The thing that uh, we should look unto is the glory of Christ. Is my glory the same glory like of Jesus Christ? You know, it is so funny when people say, because somebody is not doing this thing, I'll not do it. And if such and such a person gets to heaven through get the gate, I'll get through it the window. And if he enters through the window, I'll get through the door. Because they see somebody else is so much unworthy that they start comparing men to men and what they are doing. Instead of looking to Christ and asking, am I looking like Christ? People will ask themselves, am I looking like Sam? Am I looking like so and so? And who does Sami has heaven for you so that you may look like Sami? I don't have heaven for you. I don't have heaven for anyone. The person that we should be looking at is Jesus Christ. How are we presently standing before God? I was shown that time is so short and what we must do is must do it quickly, the prophet says. In early writing 71, those who will be protected during from the mark of the beast, they must right now exercise and train themselves to say no to the beast. They must reflect the image of Jesus Christ fully, not reflect the image of a neighbor fully. You know, sometimes we, we speak things which actually uh, the Lord looks at us and asks, is the standard of righteousness, fellow men? I'll be writing page 71. Let us look at it. I don't want to paraphrase it. This is what it says. I also that men do not realize what they must be in order to live in the sight of the Lord without a high priest in the sanctuary through the time of trouble. Those who receive the seal of the living God and are protected in the time of trouble must reflect the image of Jesus fully. It doesn't say that you must reflect the image of a neighbor. You know, in our arguments, we make none effect the blood of Jesus Christ and exalt man to the position of Christ. When we start looking at men, and what does the Bible say in Jeremiah? Cast is a man who leans in the arm of flesh. And in the midst verse of the Bible, Psalms 118, do we know what it says? It, it, it's not the will of God. Cast is the one who looks for the at the princess. Psalms 118. Let us see this. Psalms 118, the midst, the midst verse in the Bible. Psalms 118 verse 8. And verse 9. This is what the Bible says. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. This is the midst verse in the Bible. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in the priest, in the princess. And then Jeremiah tells us one thing, the book of Jeremiah. Cast. I just put that verse like that. Verse 17, verse 5. This is the verse. And what does it say? Thus said the Lord, Cast be the man that trusted in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departed from the Lord. And so there have been a habit always of looking at fellow men and saying, oh, if this is like this, and though so is like this, and if he's going to heaven, then I'll be there automatically. No, brothers and sisters, we must acknowledge and reflect the image of Christ fully, not the image of fellow men. We must acknowledge our wickedness and iniquity. We must confess the sins of our fathers. We have sinned against thee. The prayer of Daniel in Daniel chapter 8 chapter 9 is our prayer for the name of the Lord is profaned amongst the ungodly because of us and what the Lord needed 
from our forefathers is not what he needs from us. The, the Lord has increased our light and he doesn't accept us to give a face of righteousness. Let me try find this. That is Great Controversy, page 164, paragraph 1. Look at this. There are many at the present day thus clinging to the customs and traditions of their fathers. When the Lord sends them additional light, they refuse to accept it because not having been granted to their fathers, it was not received by them. We are not placed where our fathers were. Consequently, our duties and responsibilities are not the same as theirs. We shall not be approved of God in looking to the example of our fathers to determine our duty instead of searching the word of truth for ourselves. Our responsibility is greater than that is greater than was that of our ancestors. We are accountable for the light which they received and which was handed down as an inheritance for us, and we are accountable also for the additional light which is now shining upon us from the word of God. Did even our forefathers understand the three angels' messages? Yes, Abraham maybe understood it, Jacob understood it, Enoch walked with God and he was no more, he understood this. Abraham saw the day of the Lord and he rejoiced in it, the book of John chapter 5. But actually we are told that the karmas in the sanctuary, they were not sanctified their conscience, they were only sanctified their flesh, but we are sanctified our conscience in the time of reformation when the high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, and we must offer offering acceptable to the Lord. Brothers and sisters, are we listening? The devil... What does the prophet tell us on the day of atonement? She says, Let every soul know assuredly that in this man there is a righteousness to pass the judgment. Oh, say some, I know that my justification is in him, but must I not have sanctification to pass the judgment? Certainly and perfect sanctification too, but it is not found in us, it is found only in Christ. He is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Continued on, God forbid that we be presumptuous enough to present our own life at the judgment and be cast out of the marriage, nor plan to come to the judgment when we imagine that we have matured a perfect character under the latter end. Then it will be too late and the Lord will say, depart from me, I never knew you. Our life will never do. There is only one life to pass, the test of judgment, and that is the perfect life of Christ. That is Acts chapter 4 verse 12. No name under heaven and earth that man must be saved, but the name of Jesus Christ. We must be dead and alive hid in Christ in God. Then Christ stands in the presence of God for us. Ephesians 1 3, Corinthians 1 30. That is 1 Corinthians 1.30, Matthew 22, 11 to 13, Matthew 25, the virgins, and Matthew 22. All must be clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ and not their own. Look at what Christ is doing for us on this day. The final atonement, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, good news to preach unto the world unto them that dwell on the earth, that is to the living, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory to him, for the hour of the judgment is come. The trumpet has blown in sound, and all who will gather have gathered for the solemn assembly. Referring to Joel chapter 2. As they look upon him who they have pierced, Christ was upon them the spirit of grace and supplication. God's people have a deep sense of their unworthiness. They realize that the testimony of the true witness to the Laodicean is specially applicable to them. They realize that they have nothing. They afflict their souls in full consciousness of the sinfulness of their lives. Satan seeks to overwhelm them with discouragement as he points to their defect characters. They agonize and plead before God in deep humility. This is the state of Joshua in Zechariah chapter 3. 
They realize that Christ has everything while they have nothing, and they cast themselves solely upon his merit. Then Christ, having his people cooperating with him in the great work of cleansing the sanctuary, steps forward for them in the judgment. He pleads his blood, offers his perfect life before the Father, and the command is given. Zechariah chapter 3. Take away the filthy garments from them. Christ makes the final atonement, blots out the sins of the people, and clothes them with his righteousness forever. Praise the Lord. Amen. This is what the Lord is seeking to do in the day of atonement. Will we accept the life of the Son of God? Will we accept that it is only Christ who can clothe us with his garment of righteousness as it is written in Isaiah 61 verse 10. Let us read Isaiah 61 verse 10 and verse 11 together. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. Not that I have clothed myself, he has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. For as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. It is the doing of the Lord. But this doing of the Lord, we have ourselves to give ourselves unto him, to surrender and use the oath he has given to us. No one is going to heaven as a, a passive passenger. Look here, in our higher calling, the book, uh, our higher calling, Page 310. This is what the prophet says. There, there, there should be a need of surrendering. For because Christ cannot force the will. Christ can, in fact we are told that force is the last resort of every false religion. We are created beings of uh, free choice. That is a prerogative that Christ has given to us. And so if we can't take this opportunity to give ourselves to Christ and use the oath, his strength that he has given unto us to walk unto perfect holiness, there is nothing else that he can do for us. Christ cannot do anything for us if we don't uh, actually surrender ourselves. She says, uh, how you calling? Man cannot be told to heaven, he cannot go as a passive passenger. He must himself use the oath and work as a laborer with God. What? If you think you can lay down the oath and still make your way upstream, you are mistaken. It is only by honest effort, by using the oath with all your might, that you can stem the current. How many there are weak as water when they have a never failing source of strength? Heaven is ready to impart to us that we may be mighty in God. And attain the full stature of men and women in Christ Jesus. But who of you in the past year have been making progress in the way of holiness? Who have been enabled to gain one precious attainment after another until envy, pride, malice, jealousy, and every evil stain have been swept away and only the graces of the Spirit remain? Maybe we don't believe he can, but he says this in Christ Object Lesson, page 333, paragraph 1. As the will of man cooperates with the will of God, it becomes omnipotent. Whatever is to be done at his command may be accomplished in his strength. All his biddings are enablings. Do we believe? Where is our faith, brothers and sisters? We are told that faith is a substance of things hoped for, things not seen. And if it is a substance, then it means it is tangible. And how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing the word of God. And so what is faith? Faith is believing that the Lord will do what his word has said it will do. And his biddings are his enablings. God cannot do anything 
for a sinner if he doesn't give his will unto him. God himself cannot perfect human character if man cannot cooperate with him. He cannot save us. He cannot make us whole again. Satan may use force, but God will never use force on us. It is a choice for everyone. It is a realization that uh, we need something that we don't have, and that something is in Christ Jesus Christ. We may accept the atonement. We may accept his righteousness. That the latter rain may have something to do in our lives. Now, look at this illustration that uh, I'm going to put on the screen right now. Because this is important to me. Look at this illustration. We have the services of the daily, which is continual atonement in the holy place. The karma they are in with the hands on the lamb to be crucified or sacrificed. And then it goes to the veil. But when it comes on the day of atonement, then he has to hold the righteousness of Jesus Christ because the blood has been shed already. So in the holy place, the, during the daily services, there is pardon, there is regeneration. It is sealed for the former reign, prepares for death and judgment, experience of all the resurrected saints. But when you come in the most holy place, we have what we call the blotting out of sins, complete and eternal deliverance from sin, sealed with the latter rain, glory of holiest field, the soul temple, prepares for translation. So the experience in the holy place and in the daily services, it is the experience of dying and resurrecting, dying and resurrecting. It is the experience of the former rain. It is the experience of pardon. But on the day of atonement, we have a special atonement, which is the blotting out of sins, a complete regeneration, the sealing of the latter rain, and it prepares for translation, not judgment. The work of the daily services was to prepare a people for the judgment. The work in the most holy place was to prepare a people for to start a new religious year. This is the work in the antitype we are to prepare for translation, not for judgment, because judgment, the work in the daily services prepares for judgment, but the work in the most holy place prepares us for translation. Yet, people are preparing for judgment instead of preparing for translation. We have an identity crisis in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, brothers and sisters. The sanctuary message has been neglected by our people, the priest, the laity, the clergy, name it, you know, the high priest is in heaven. So the clergy have neglected this, the laity have neglected this, and the normal church attender doesn't know anything because no one wants to step on anyone's toe. If you step on people's toes, then they won't come to the church and you won't have tithes and offering. That is a problem because some are living for tithes and offering. But a trumpet must be blown in Zion and a holy fast be proclaimed. And people must be urged to come to the truth as it is in Jesus Christ. The dispensation in the first apartment is repentance remission, the former rain. The dispensation in the most holy place it is the blotting out, it is the latter rain, and it is the preparation for translation. In fact, as a matter of fact, let us go to the book of, uh, of uh, Hebrews chapter 6. And by the way, if you have never studied the book of Hebrews, which is a sanctuary outline, I, I, I pray that you may study it for yourself. Hebrews chapter 6. Let us 
see this what Paul even talks about in this time that we are living in, uh, reflecting on that. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to on and to perfection. He says that let us leave these things of the principles of the doctrine of Christ. And he will say what are these principles of the doctrine of Christ. He says let us go unto perfection. And perfection was found in the most holy place, not in the holy place. And he says the principles of the doctrine of Christ are not laying again the foundation of repentance. That is the work of the holy place. From dead works, sinning and repenting and faith toward God. Of the doctrine of baptism that is in the outer court and of laying on of hands which is actually the sinner came with the lamb put the hands on the goat or the lamb and they confessed their sins and the blood was taken in the uh, uh, holy place in the veil that separated the holy and the most holy place these are the principles of the doctrine of Christ. He says, let us leave them and go unto perfection. Let us leave the courtyard. That is what Paul is speaking in uh, chapter 6 of Hebrews and he says and of eternal judgment how was the eternal judgment revealed in the courtyard it is by the ashes of the heifers and the bullocks and the lambs that were actually burned at the altar of burnt sacrifice these are the principles of the doctrine of Christ they used to teach about how salvation is God. But now we have to move from how salvation is God, but move to possessing that salvation itself. And he says, let us move to perfection, and this we will do if God permit. Can we say that the Lord has not permitted for us to go to perfection? Has, can we say that the Lord has not allowed us to leave the courtyard? Is that what we want to say on this day of atonement? What then? Shall we say that the blood of Jesus Christ which he has entered into the most holy place and not the blood of the heifers, the blood of the gods and the bulls are nothing? Paul says, let us leave these principles that are in the courtyard. Let us leave courtyard in good perfection while Jesus Christ serving in the most holy place. But we love to, the, to be in the courtyard, moving inside and outside the sanctuary. One day, like the foolish virgins, we come in and the door is closed. Where will you go? Do we realize the nearness of the events? Do we realize how Christ is fighting with his church? This is the outline of the sanctuary. This is number 20 of 21 in the series, The Latter Rain, the sanctuary outline. We have to pray the Lord to help us. The angel of Revelation chapter 18 is about to come down and finish its work. What is my condition? What is your condition? In closing, let us look at these things as we close. With great rejoicing in the blessing of the Day of Atonement, the people they quickly gathered in the remainder of the yearly harvest so that they could enjoy satisfaction of years work well done at the great harvest of the feast of the tabernacles that is when christ comes we are going to the feast of tabernacles in like manner when god's people experience the great blessing of the seal of god they will not be idle with faces lighted up fresh from the great victory and constrained by the might of the spirit spirit's power they will quickly gather in the final harvest of soul for the kingdom with such an army of workers, the final in gathering will be completed with the speed of the lightning of Ezekiel. Then all the ransom of the Lord will go home with Jesus, rejoicing with joy unspeakable and full of glory to celebrate the great and typical Feast of Tabernacles. Eternity stretches before us, but before that glad will come into the eternal city is unfinished task. We all recognize that according to our present progress it is an insurmountable mountain which lies between us and translation we can never accomplish this if christ do not intervene i repeat we cannot accomplish this We should seek Christ in our everyday life. What is our condition as we speak? 
our work is to remedy every defect. Our work is to remedy every defect of our character. And I'll be coming to that quote in a, a short while. The work of I'll be coming to that in a while. I, I just want to go through a few sentiments here. And then I'll come to the youth instructor which speaks about uh, remedying the defects of our characters. This is so important. And so, this is it. This is what uh, we are speaking in closing. Shall we appreciate the work that is going on in the heavenly sanctuary? This is the word of the Lord, not by might, not by power, but the Spirit, said the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain? Whichever mountain that is before thee, the mountain of adultery, the mountain of pride, the mountain of envy, jealousy, thou shalt become plain. Amen. Zechariah 4, 6. Fear not, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. I'll pour out my spirit upon flesh. Joel 2, 21-28. This is what the Lord of the harvest is waiting to do for us. The Son of Righteousness is waiting to rise upon His people with healing in His wings. But let us not forget that before Zechariah 4 comes the cleansing and sealing of Zechariah 3. Joshua is depicted in Zechariah chapter 3, standing before the Lord with filthy garments. And the Lord says, take away the filthy garments and give him a good robe and then a might upon his head, which is like holiness to Jehovah. This is the sealing. And then we see the pipes and uh, the, 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 that are in Zechariah chapter 4 and the oil is flowing in the pipes and we have the two anointed one there which means the latter rain but let us not forget before Zechariah 4 we have Zechariah 3 and then the showers of Joel 2 comes this solemn assembly at the sanctuary before the healing of the Almighty come the stripe of the Laodicean rebuke we must Open the door of the heart to Jesus and his ministry in the most holy place. We must allow his unrestricted access to his temple so that he may make the final ministry operative in our lives. We, we want to take away the filthy garments and write his name upon us. He wants to finish this work in our lives now so that he may come to us in the fullness of his divine presence and prepare us for translation. Christ is waiting and anxious to do this work now it pleases god to do it now this is the conviction kindled in my heart and at this time truly light is breaking on the tops of mountain behold the bridegroom come go ye out and meet him this is it so we have the program of events here in closing i'll just like to show them in closing i have like two slides three slides so this is it what do we have we have the close of probation so, on the far right, we have the close of probation. This is the illustration of the end time events. This is the sanctuary outline of things. And then before that, something has to happen. This is it. 1833, William Miller with the midnight cry. The angel begin to sound. That is the first angel begin to sound. And then we have... The first angel going until the close of probation. It, ha it doesn't have to stop. The hour of judgment is come. It is going on and it's about to close. It is when he finishes that the first angel also stops sounding. Then 1844 comes and this alignment, spring, expected time of Jesus' return. Nothing uh, actually eventuated. And then the people did not know what is the sanctuary. Summer of 1844 come meetings. They found what is the error. And then uh, they correct the error. They know that Christ is moving from actually the holy place into the most holy place. The second angel's message joined by the midnight cry. The second angel is Babylon is fallen. Those churches who after the great disappointment in 1844 fell behind, they went under the second angel's message, Babylon is fallen. And so it has been sounding. And then we have the autumn, October 1844. Great disappointment comes in. Judgment for the dead begins at that point. And then we have the third angel's message running from 
1846, 1847, when the Sabbath message, in fact, it was at Rochester in 1488 when he was giving, given the, the message of the sealing and the message of uh, uh, the Sabbath, where actually the prophetess had been told, telling Joseph Beth that you don't have to uh, preach this thing. It is not a must, but the Lord revealed unto her in 1848 in Doncaster, is it Man Manchester? Doncaster? That is it. And she was able to start giving uh, heed to the message. After that, in 1863, actually we had the health message being, being given to the church. At the same time, the health and temperance movement, and at the same time, the organization of the church and the giving of the name. And the second, third angel's message, they were going on. Then, 1888, we have the rejection of the loud cry, which was calmed down. I touched on it yesterday, uh, on, on these events when uh, uh, I was doing the presentation, the universal death decree, what happened in 1888 and what will come to happen in the future. Go and look at that uh, presentation of yesterday, number 19. So, 1888, we have 80 Jones and Wagoner coming with the message. And uh, uh, the, uh, there was a time Washburn went to, to see Sister White and asked her uh, about um, Eti Jones and Wagona and she confessed that Wagona has been given clear light even more than her on justification by faith. But the brethren in Minneapolis feared something and so the loud cry never happened. And so there we have the judgment of the living commences at the time sometime and I, I i touched about the judgment of the living in uh, the presentation number number 13 the judgment of the living you can look at that it, it's detailed and uh, you can send me what you think about it it's on my timeline i'll be uploading the presentations on youtube starting uh on thursday so that uh, we may be able to see these things if they are so and so uh judgment of the living at some time begins when it begins at that point, the angel of Revelation chapter 18, I, we saw it so clearly. It will come down when the judgment of the living starts. The day, the hour, it is not revealed. But we are told at that time the angel of Revelation 18 will come down and then there will be a loud cry. The latter rain will fall and the people of God. Shaking will happen, separation, foolish virgins, the, la the final sealing, and then Christ is seen. Final atonement, blotting out of sin, the seal of God, the mark of the beast is added on the people, and then the full outpouring of the Holy Spirit. These are the events. Time of trouble happens, and then we have the seven last plagues. At the transition between the sixth plague and the seventh plague, we have the mighty earthquake, and in that mighty earthquake, it is said it is done, and the Lord announced the hour and the day, of his of Christ's second coming and the saints will rejoice that uh, they have been crying day and night but uh, I, I want the, the time of trouble that is coming before us uh, I want you to look at something the time of trouble that is coming before us it is it's not something that is symbol I, I was reading this and I have been shocked to read this thing uh, that was happening in the time of trouble. I want to share with you. Time of trouble. This is found in uh, Great Conrover 608. The time is coming and we have to prepare, brothers and sisters. Let us read what will happen at that point. I, I have only two slides and it will be all. It says in Great Conroversy 608, In this time of persecution, the faith of the Lord's servant will be tried. They have faithfully given the warning, looking to God and to his word alone. God's spirit moving upon their hearts has constrained them to speak. Stimulated with holy zeal and with the divine impulse strong upon them, they ended upon the performance of their duties without coldly calculating the consequence of speaking to the people the word which the Lord had given them. They have not consulted their temporal interests nor sought to preserve their repetition of life of their lives. Yet when the storm of opposition and reproach bursts upon them, some overwhelmed with consternation will be ready to exclaim, 
had we foreseen the consequence of our words, we would have held our peace. They are hedged with difficulties. Saturn assails them with fierce temptation. The work which they have undertaken seems far beyond their ability to accomplish. They are threatened with destruction. The enthusiasm which may animated them is gone, yet they cannot turn back. Then feeling their utter helplessness, they flee to the mighty one for strength. They remember that the words which they have spoken were not theirs, but his was he, but his who bade them give the warning. God put the truth into their hearts and they could not forbear to proclaim it. The same trial had been experienced by men of God in ages past. Wycliffe, Haas, Luther, Tyndale, Baxter, Wesley urged that all doctrines be brought to the test of the Bible and declared that they would renounce everything which it condemned. Against these men, persecution raged with relentless fury, yet they ceased not to declare the truth. Different periods in the history of the church have each been marked by the development of some special truth, adapted to the necessities of God's people at that time. Every new truth has made its way against hatred and opposition. Those who are blessed with its light were tempted and tried. The Lord gives special truth for the people in an emergency, who they are refused to publish it. He commands his servant to present the last invitation of mercy to the world. They cannot remain silent except at the peril of their souls. Christ's ambassadors have nothing to do with consequences. They must perform their duty and leave the results with God, GC 609, paragraph 1. Let me finish with the slide here that I was talking about the seven last plagues follow and it will be a time of great trouble then the second coming happens at that point and so we have the events that are before us my final admoni admonition to you is this and to myself this is my final admonition to all of us and uh, it is found in the youth instructor It is found in the youth instructor. I have just to give you the year and the page. This is what we read in closing. But above all, aim to copy the perfect pattern. Jesus led a life of self-denial. In his examples, there is nothing for you to shun. It was his daily employment to comfort the sorrowing, to relieve the suffering, and to help and bless all who came to him. He is the same pitying Savior now that he was 1800 years ago. And he will not turn away a single repenting sinner. You may have access to his strength and wisdom. Through the merits of his blood, you may overcome every spiritual foe and remedy every defect of character. Jesus was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And by beholding him, you may become changed into the same image. Amen. Blessings, brothers and sisters. I know he who has called us is able to give us strength. As he says in Philippians chapter 1. He says in Philippians chapter 1 that uh, he says in Philippians chapter 1 the word of God which does not err being confident of this thing very thing that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ, that is the second coming of Jesus Christ. I believe what the word of the Lord says. Let us believe in prayer as we seek the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we have been a people of doubt. We come before thee. What you have spoken is truth. What you need of us there is nothing that you lie, you will give us strength. 
You say in Matthew 5, 48, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. You have never required of us something that you cannot make us do. Help us to understand the times that we are living in and what Jesus Christ is doing in the heavenly sanctuary. Bless the children and fortify their minds with the word. For thy word we have hidden in our hearts that we may not sin against thee. Praise be unto thy name, in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, thank you so much, brothers and sisters, for joining in. And uh, may the blessings of the Lord be upon you. May he work for all of us to perfect character. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>